Joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast, John Sloan III. He is the code lead organizer for BLM Detroit, the Black Lives Matter Detroit. John, I loved our conversation the last time. It's great to have you back on today. Thank you, Ron. It's good to be back. So uh, give us a little bit of an update because I feel like we went through this firestorm and now things have calmed down. And I don't know if that's because of the election and the new president elect, or are things just boiling behind the scenes again, waiting for another eruption that maybe we don't know about? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. You know, I think um, protest goes in cycles like this, right? And for those of us that are activists and organizers 24 seven, the work doesn't stop. Um, and so I think the last time we talked, we talked about the, the benefit and the, the productivity that in the street on the ground protests can have and the type of momentum they can help build. So since the last time we spoke, we've really been kind of pushing the ball down the field on something we're calling the Detroiters Bill of Rights. Um, and we're working in conjunction with several other organizers in the city, um, along with two other city council members, uh, Raquel Castaneda Lopez and uh, Pro Tem Mary Sheffield. Um, and we've actually had some major successes, which we should be ready to announce hopefully uh, very soon after the new year, um, in, in terms of getting certain rights enshrined in the Detroit City Charter. And so those protests over the summer created that leverage, created that energy that we needed to be able to put that political pressure um, on our legislators and help us get that uh, ball moved down the field. So do you anticipate there is going to be another round of protests or do you feel like due to uh, the various people that are being elected into office, it's opening up the dialogue to try to come to some type of compromise and resolution to some of the issues that you and others have? Well, so I think it's important to define what we mean by protests, right? Um, there are a lot of people out there. I, I heard your last guest speaking about um, children and families that are houseless um, and need food, right? There are a lot of individuals that depending upon your station in life, depending upon where society has defined you to exist in this kind of social order and hierarchy, your existence is protest. Um, and so there, there are a lot of individuals that take regular everyday actions that could be defined as revolutionary. Whether or not there'll be another um, round of in the street protest actions, similar to what we saw this past summer, I think largely depends on how our public officials respond um, to what it is that we're asking for. Um, and in some senses, there are going to be compromises that are going to be available. In some senses, there aren't. Um, I get invited on you know, media shows like yours sometimes, and they say, you know, we're going to invite somebody from the other side. And my question is always, well, what's the other side of human rights? I don't know what that other side is. Um, what's the other side of equity? What's the other side of, of civil justice? Um, and so I think in a lot of instances, the danger that, can, that could exist, right, is that by assuming that with President-elect uh, Biden, um, and, and Ms. Harris coming into office, that now everything's okay. That we're gonna go back to this time where eight and 10 years ago, um, where everybody was all right before Donald Trump came into office. Well, eight to 10 years ago, Detroiters still didn't have equitable access to water. Eight to 10 years ago, you were still seeing gentrification and modern forms of redlining. Eight to 10 years ago, there was still massive disparity between what students might have in Troy or West Bloomfield to what students might have in Detroit in terms of educational um, access to resources. So eight to 10 years ago was not an option for us. Um, and I think the more protests that occur will be directly correlative to the action that our public servants do or don't take. So John, with that, can we talk a little bit about your thoughts on, there's a difference between a protest and destruction of property. Because do you feel like some of the looting, and I will tell you, so I was caught up in the riots in downtown Cleveland. It was one of, it was a very uncomfortable situation and feeling I've ever had in my life. And, and with that, I think of these businesses that employed minorities, that employed people that were trying to make their lives better and their businesses were destroyed. So can you address the difference between a protest and the civil unrest that we saw? Yeah, um, and, and I wanna, wanna first start by clarifying nobody that was a member of the Detroit chapter of Black Lives Matter was involved in any sort of rioting or protesting, and I and that's a that's a big and bold statement, right? And so it's a lot for me to be able to say that with 100% certainty, and I can, um, and I want to make that clear right up front. A, a lot of the tensions, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the tensions that you'll see when you're talking about um, 
the destruction of property, right? Tend to come from, and this is a this is a broad statement now, tend to come from individuals that aren't always part of that community. You very rarely, very rarely see individuals destroying property um, where they live. And so this happens a lot. I live in a neighborhood in Detroit that is in the middle of a gentrifying process, right? As it has been for the past five to 10 years. And the number of times I have to walk outside of my house and put on some gloves and pick up trash and garbage that has been left on the street by people that don't live here, that come in for a Friday night and then drive away um, is ridiculous. And so I think we have to qualify those individuals that are actually taking part in, in some sort of civil action and unrest. The other side of your question is the way that the uh, law enforcement agencies respond to peaceful protest actions. And I think what we saw this summer in DPD's response was a measure of overreaction, um, dramatically so in certain instances, um, that provokes certain reactions on the other side. Um, and so I'm not going to speak to any one police officer in particular or in individual. Um, what I will say, though, is that the Detroit Police Department participates in a federal program called the 1033 program. And that 1033 program creates a direct pipeline from the Department of Justice to local law enforcement agencies and gives them immediate and direct access to military grade equipment, to tanks, to assault weapons, to tear gas. And they have a use it or lose it clause in that program, which means if DPD does not use that equipment, they will lose the access to that equipment. So when we start thinking about what these intersections look like, when we start thinking about what it means to create broad systemic change, we have to ask ourselves where all these forces are coming from. And a lot of instances I saw with my own two eyes, um, DPD escalate situations that did not need to be so. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Just so you know, too, I also worked for uh, ATF. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. I was not an agent, but I was their public information officer. But with that, um, I know what some of these officers, I, I know people that work for DPD and the sacrifice that they go through each and every day. And their job is so much more difficult today than it ever was before. But on top of that, people who are involved in some of these protests do things to try to get the reaction out of officers that they want. And at the end of the day, the officers want to go home. Some of these officers are making 13, 14, 15 bucks an hour. I, and, and they're putting their lives on the line and they see people at their best and at their worst. And, but at the end of the day, they're also human. So what about the incidents? If, if, if it is truly a peaceful protest, what's being done to escalate it to that point? I'm sorry, but if you're told move back, you need to move back. You don't keep going forward, you move back. I mean, there's a reason to, and, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, because I'm in the middle on this, but there are things that all, that law enforcement know that maybe that they can't make public and they're trying for a safety standpoint that they can't reveal to some of the individuals. Yeah, so let me first start by saying I have friends that are members of DPD. Um, I have the utmost respect for anybody that would willingly take on that job, right? I didn't do it. So the fact that you chose to do that, um, man, woman, or non-binary individuals, I have all the respect for you in the world. That's number one. Number two, I think when we talk about the way policing intersects with the community, we have to talk about the broader system, the way that it's set up, and the positions that it puts those police officers in. Um, oftentimes when we start talking about um, instances of over policing, it's because officers are being asked to respond to circumstances that they haven't been trained for and that in, in all reality, they should not have to respond to. So if you go back to what we were talking about at the top of this um, interview in the Detroiters Bill of Rights, one thing that we're pushing for in that is a mental health crisis response team, not police officers responding to mental health crises, but trained individuals, therapists, social workers that have the skill set to be able to do that. I, I think oftentimes when people hear terms like defund the police or demilitarize the police, they, the pendulum swings to the other side for them. Um, and whether that's because of a media narrative or not, they hear that we want lawlessness, that we want to completely obliterate any form of safety. And when in actuality, what we're saying is that safety and policing are different things. Physical safety is a part of broader safety, but your mental health is a part of safety. Food equity and access to housing is a part of safety. So when we're talking about police officers that 
might be having uh, frictious and difficult interactions with protesters. A lot of, I think, what we're talking about is the way the system has established them and put them at opposite sides as adversaries, naturally. Um, and we have to uh, we have to eliminate that standing in and of itself. We have to refuse to accept that binary that either you're on the side of the police or you're on the side of lawlessness, that either you're on the side of the community or you're on the side of evil over policing, right? Like the truth is actually in the middle. There are three sides to every story. And I think the more that we can create those type of dialogues, the better it will be. The one thing that I will say is, and you probably know this having with your background for the ATF, um, the use of tear gas and chemical weapons and biological weapons on citizens, the use of tear gas over the summer, um, that's, a spe that's a special carve out, right? The, the Geneva Conventions, Biological Conventions Warfare from the UN bans tear gas in times of war. And so there are certain things, there are questions that we have to ask as to why this is okay to use against citizens and, and residents um, that pay their taxes and, and show up to work and are part of this community and when it is in other circumstances. And I think none of these things can be taken in vacuum. So this conversation that you and I are having right here is really, really important. But if you only ever have just this part of the conversation and don't have the other parts of the conversation about mental health stability and about who is responding to mental health crises, about training and the type of training that police officers get, about the pay and whether or not police officers are being paid an equitable rate for what we're asking of them. Like if you don't have all sides of that conversation, then you're only ever gonna end up with insufficient answers. I had an officer years ago, years ago before mental health was even being discussed. And she was saying the biggest issue facing policing today was the mental health crisis. And no one was talking about it, especially in the state of Michigan. Right. And, you know, so it one thing that we hope comes out of this crisis and this pandemic, although the Black Lives Movement is not a pandemic crisis, but I think it helped bring some of these issues to light as well, is to be able to open up the conversation as well. But there are people who feel like they can't talk out because they may be deemed racist. What are your thoughts about that? Because I think all sides need to be talked about in order to flush out the, the differences and the preconceived notions. Sure. So I think first thing we have to do is, is define some things, right? So what is racism versus prejudice? Because people talk about this all the time. The prejudicial thought is the thing that makes me feel like I'm better than you. The thing that makes me say as a cisgendered heteronormative man, I'm better than a woman. That's the prejudicial thought, right? What turns that into sexism and patriarchy is my ability to benefit. The fact that society has structured certain power dynamics that can allow me to take advantage of that prejudice. And so when we start talking talking about whether somebody is or isn't racist, we also have to talk about their tacit participation in this broader system that gives them some advantage. For BLM Detroit and for another organization I work with called the Detroit Safety Team, we practice call-in culture versus call-out culture. And the difference is, is um, small but significant. The difference is instead of saying, you are racist, this is your fault, you need to go away. It's saying, hey, listen, what you just said was really inappropriate, was really racist. This is how it contributes. Let's talk about it. And let's make sure that you understand why that is so and start to have a dialogue. Um, it's also a very fine line because I've been in certain conversations where somebody has said, well, I'm just gonna say whatever I wanna say. And they've said some things that have been the most offensive um, language possible. And the way to get around that is by taking the onus off of the victim. By, by you would never ask an individual that had been sexually assaulted to teach their uh, assaulter right, why what they did was incorrect. And in that same context, the onus for correcting um, social injustice should not be put on the individuals that are being socially oppressed. So it's my job as a, a straight cisgendered man to get straight cisgendered men when they speak out of turn, when they put people down, when they try to assert that sort of gendered privilege. Th that's, those are my friends, those are my people, and I'm responsible because I share that identity for being able to take care of them. Right. Um, we should not ask individuals that are constantly being oppressed to carry that weight. And I think part of the reason that we see this difficulty in having that conversation is because we're putting those people in the same room. Right. Like we're putting in this analogy, we're putting people that have been sexually assaulted in the room with the sexual assaulters. And we're not asking those other individuals who might be adjacent to them to really check them on their privilege. And that's the first step. How do you be an effective ally? How do you be an effective comrade? By checking people on their privilege when you have the greater proximity to them than somebody else. And it all starts with a conversation because if people aren't aware 
then they'll continue down that path. But it's when they are made aware, but they need to, it starts with the conversation. It absolutely does. I've said plenty of times to friends of mine sitting at a bar somewhere, having a beer, having a drink, watching a game that might make a comment to a female bartender. And I've said, well, wait, time out. That's not that's not the way we should act. That's not the way we should behave. And I can have that conversation with them because they're a friend of mine. And that's how that conversation has to start, right? And I think the more that we ask of ourselves to have that conversation and put ourselves in, in potentially difficult or awkward situations with friends of ours, with family members of ours, right? Where it's a little bit easier than in the other circumstance. I know, I know it's not always the easiest thing to do, but this type of social progress isn't easy. It's going to require that everybody is put into a difficult or awkward situation at some point. And those conversations are definitely going to be highlighted going into the holiday season. Uh, with that, John, I always love having you on the show because I learned so much talking to you. John Sloan the third with us. He's the co-lead organizer of the uh, Black Lives Movement Matter here in Detroit. With that, John, before I let you go, anything maybe I didn't touch on that you want to get out to the public before I let you go? Sure. So we're actually in the middle of a big push. Um, a lot of people try to provide uh, school supplies to youth at the beginning of the year and don't realize that can be an ongoing need for certain families depending upon their station and their access. So we're trying to provide 1,500 book bags to students um, across the city of Detroit coming in January. And so that's going to be book bags filled with school supplies, filled with PPE, and we need some support on that. So it's just $30 per child. You can go to our website, you go to blmdetroit.com backslash donate. Um, and if you can just help us out, that money is going to go directly to our ability to support youth and their access to educational resources. So, uh, you know, with that, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I appreciate coming here every single time and I hope everybody has a happy holiday season.